we need to focus on maybe helping find the visitor the right product or helping find the, the visitor find the right information. Um, I don't know how many of you um, talk with a customer and say, okay, which is the metric that after one year after launch of our website, we will go back and then say the project was a success. Um, probably you don't know. And does, does your customer even know when it's a success? Sometimes you say, okay, Google Analytics, and you look at how many visitors, and it's okay, it's going up, and SEO-wise, we're doing really well, um, but that's more or less where it stops uh, for, for many. Um, I'm sure some, some of you or people that are listening in um, go further um, and try to define metrics on how many products were bought, uh, or indeed, like how many form submissions did we get, the lead capturing, all that stuff. Um, I'm not going to talk about that a lot uh, more. But what is happening? Um, and maybe some of you also saw the, the blog post of Dries that um, uh, Acquia now got into the DXP quadrant. Um, and um, it's, it's important to understand what, what these companies are. And so the Gartner is an analyst. Um, company and what they do is they kind of go to all these big companies um, or big companies pay them basically um, and they, they try to do an analyst uh, an analysis of all the products that they have and then see okay how do they compete there used to be a CMS quadrant um, where you had uh, also Acquia or Drupal there was automatic with WordPress um, there was also Adobe, Sitecore, um, AP Server, LifeRay, etc. But Gartner decided uh, the CMS quadrant uh, um, is no longer exists. It's right now a DXP quadrant. And then um, I'm sure you all have uh, similar thoughts about okay, but what does this mean, and, and who cares, and what's this buzzword again? Um, am I wrong? Um, probably not. Yeah. Um, but. Then ultimately, you also want to figure out, okay, but okay, what, what does this mean then, and where are those companies going, and how can can I, as maybe a site developer or as a, a, a company that, that's a bit smaller scale, um, also take profit from that trend um, in maybe the mid market or uh, towards government um, or other use cases. So let's take a look at some of these competitors and, and take a look also at, at what they offer. So here we see Adobe, um, and Adobe says, okay, we have all multi-channel, um, and then below it we have this building blocks for a digital experience platform, all very fancy words. Um, what we see also there is that um, the, the pure CMS uh, is just one little block of web content management. Okay? But we also see that there's personalized marketing, um, whatever it may mean, um, but this is how they present all their products in a single block. To go look at Sitecore, you see very similar things. Uh, you see multi-channel at the top, and then there's the CMS components uh, as management, uh, content, uh, product information, maybe media, um, things that Drupal also can do. And then you have the Sitecore AI EA, um, with analytics, insights, decisions, automation. Um, so this is where they, they kind of claim, okay, we can um, make different decisions based on visitors on the site, uh, also known as personalization. Um, there's also some marketing automation uh, on the right that they have, which is all then connected to this customer data. It's all still very vague on what that actually means, um, but this is how it presents what the solutions. Okay. So if we take a look at Acquia, Acquia has three pillars. They have this Drupal cloud, um, which um, you all know, I suppose, it's, it's Drupal, it's the open source um, software that we all love. Um, but they put it on steroids on, on a cloud um, provider, uh, or they are the cloud provider, and they give you a lot of the guarantees, but they also have this quick start. And there's the content cloud. Um, this is somewhat of a CMS uh, thing. Um, but then the more interesting part is on, on the right, this is marketing cloud. So that's where they have the Motic software, um, which is the marketing automation open source software, very comparable to HubSpot, for example. But also Lyft, and Lyft is interesting in this case because that's, this is a proprietary software um, where all the data goes to, to allow personalization. So, okay, so we have open source, open source, proprietary. 
Um, so you look at LifeRay. LifeRay um, goes into this functionality requirements as in personalization, social collaboration, etc. But you can see this, this trend of personalization coming back um, and of trying to understand the, um, the intent of a customer and tuning how the site looks like according to what's happening on the site. Okay, um, maybe one more, Epic Server does a very similar thing. Um, they have this visitor intelligence and they segment the visitors and uh, they claim behavior business intelligence. All very nice marketing works um, for claiming, okay, we capture the data, we do something with that data in that customer data platform that you see as well. Um, and then um, it, on, on all the way on the right, you can see that there is this um, content recommendations, content service, that's the CMS part, but still very dynamic CMS part. Also personalized search, um, it's interesting. Uh, um, but this, this whole diagram is uh, how they deliver that. Um, now, if you take a look at at Drop Solid, which is a much more smaller scale company. Um, we tried to go to the market in the same way, um, but then with only open source um, tools and open core ideology. So we have Drupal for the CMS, and then we have marketing automation. We also follow Mautic uh, in that sense. But then we have an interesting part, which is the customer data management, um, which we use at Apache uh, Unome for. Um, I'll get back to this in, in a bit. Um, I'm trying to explain how you can also compete with uh, those um, bigger behemoths um, in a way to create those um, actual practical digital experience platforms and how um, they claim they can deliver. But let's, let's take a step back. Dries, um, uh, on his blog, um, he posted in January 2014 the following sentence. He said, like, as the Drupal community, we need to stop thinking of Drupal as a content management platform and start looking at it as a digital experience platform used to create ideal visitor experiences. If you were like me, you said, yeah, yeah, Dries, um, this is marketing speak, um, but that's five years ago. Um, I think Dries was way ahead in, in understanding where the, the big enterprises were going towards. But ultimately, also the smaller enterprises or the mid-sized enterprises are following. We didn't or really have an idea on what this meant in practice. Um, and um, also to give you like a, a personal insight, I was working at the Lift team five years ago, um, and I was building this product, but I didn't fully understand why, and um, I was also concerned about the privacy aspect um, and, and the whole um, movement towards privacy, GDPR, uh, those things that, that we know today um, are becoming more and more important. Um, so I understood the technical requirements at that point, but didn't really understand why um, and what customers or, or websites really needed to, to use this for. But again, man, why? Why should you care? Um, because you, the people in this room, or people that are, are listening in, you're the ones building those solutions. Um, none of these companies that I, I mentioned, except for uh, DropSolid, are actually building websites. Uh, you are a site builder. Um, you sit together with the customer. You decide what this web experience mm. <clears throat> should look like. And you, you sit together with the customer, you define, uh, okay, this is how we're going to make sure the website looks like, the design, this is the, the roadmap, these are the personas. You're in control, yeah. but you're also in control on deciding what technologies that you use. So let's take a step back again to, to Gartner and we ask them, okay, but what is this? digital experience platform, um, and maybe some of you have seen the, the talk of Dominique yesterday. Um, and it, it's a very vague word, um, and it's also quite hard on the internet to find out what it is not. Eh? So this digital experience platform is, is not a bucket of products. You cannot just buy this thing. It's not a website, it's not an app, 
Um, it's not a tool. Again, you cannot buy a digital experience platform. Um, it's not a one-way communication vehicle. It's also not standalone. It's not IT nor marketing. It's not monolithic. No. Um, but then, okay, well, what is it then? How can I translate these analytic words or these words and trying to define, okay, what are the capabilities into technical solutions? How can I do this with Drupal uh, without buying very expensive licenses to work other software tools? Um, let's get technical a bit. So, in the beginning of the, the software evolution, um, and there's a very interesting article on, on Medium. Um, they, they say, okay, it all started with custom software um, in, in 1980, 1990. Um, it was um, very revolutionary that you could write software and that uh, everyone started to write software and um, basic, for example, as a software language. Um, but that evolved a bit. And then uh, it moved towards commercial off-the-shelf software, this calls thing. Um, what does that mean? Um, for most of you, you maybe remember Windows 95. Um, it was a CD that you could buy, and suddenly you had this amazing um, operating system, um, and it was off-the-shelf, and you didn't have to do anything about it. Um, this was like a whole new era where everything uh, came on physical mediums. Uh, all right, so they had their run. Microsoft made a lot of money on, on, on this commercial off-the-shelf software. Um, and then another revolution started, and it's software as a service. Um, there's a really interesting book about uh, Salesforce. And um, Salesforce said software is dead, but they basically meant this commercial off-the-shelf, and so software on CDs is dead. They were the first or at least the first really big company to bring uh, software uh, online only, um, and they, they brought it as a service. Okay? And then the, the last um, the last revolution, um, which is the, the one that you're actually actively taking part of, and this is why this camp exists, this is why Drupal exists for the last 20 years, um, it's the commercial open source software revolution. It means that there is a business model or that our businesses are being created around uh, open source and open core software uh, like Drupal, uh, Drupal companies, but also Amazon, uh, for example, is um, built around open core. They have some contradictionary um, ways of doing business, so, um, uh, but for example, Redis um, is being used as the core for their caching um, product. They have uh, Docker for some of the um, Kubernetes orchestration. So they use a lot of open source software and then ask people to pay for the hosting and the maintenance. So this is the, the next really big phase. Um, so data shows, and there's an, an amazing uh, website, uh, it's on coss.media. Um, that this open core model is the dominant business model used by the most successful um, commercial off-the-shelf software, um, sorry, uh, commercial open source uh, software companies out there. If you really are embedded in this open source software, if you know that core, if you bring out the, the basic of that software uh, to the world on GitHub or Drupal.org or anything, um, people will come to you for support for um, yeah, just getting enterprise hosting, all those kind of uh, things. They don't want to do them themselves, but they do trust you because the open source software is trusted. A very good example of that is also the Red Hat. So um, they have the, the open core and they have the, the free version, um, but then they also have the version with support, uh, which is the, the support. Uh, premium that you pay for when you start up new instances. Um, just take a look at that website and see if all the companies. Acquia is one of those companies. Um, it's just a little weird that the Lyft product um, is proprietary. Um, but all the other examples that I've shown, um, in my opinion, they're, they're doomed. 
um, because they don't follow that same revolution. They're still stuck in the SaaS world, and software as a service, but fully proprietary and with licenses. Um, here in the Drupal world, I think we, we are way ahead, and that's sometimes also the, the frustration that we have against some of these software as a service products, um, but it's an opportunity. Okay. So let's take that apart and, and see what that means for Drupal um, and what are we missing in, in Drupal to build such a, a digital experience platform for a customer. And so you can also replace this sentence with, um, let's take it apart and what that means in the Drupal ecosystem to build such a website for a customer. Basically it's the same, but um, it, it combines a lot of um, functionalities to show different content or different experiences, if you will, to the visitors of that website. Okay, so this is the management pillar. Let's take a look. Okay, yeah, we have custom profiles, groups, structured data. Um, all of this seems um, very um, positive for Drupal, uh, which it also is. Uh, so these green items, um, it's my opinion that Drupal does really well. Uh, it's really well and suited for creating groups and communities. It has structured data. Uh, I think it's the most structured data and embedded uh, CMS out there. Roles and permissions, it's like an A-plus um, team site. But keeping a customer profile, uh, it gets a little tricky. We don't track all of the um, actions that a customer or a visitor does. And there's a profile in the e-commerce site. Okay, we can track the purchases. Um, but it doesn't really go in, in that. You could maybe do it with Drupal, um, but it's not really well suited for it. Same with voice and immersive elements. You could probably do custom coding, um, but it's still quite new. Um, and then also with authentication, factor authentication, etc. There's lots of, of modules out there, um, but it requires some knowledge, and maybe that's also why clients or why uh, people go to. Um, Drupal ad experts to get this done. Still Drupal. Okay. If we go to the, the next phase, which is the, the platform, um, there's a couple of things here that are also where what Drupal is very good in. Uh, maybe you can detect them already by, by reading this. Um, but in my opinion, it's the, the following. Uh, so Drupal makes custom development very easy. It allows integrations to be created and uh, expose and interact with data and safety at first. Uh, in the same sense that it's multi-channel, handless, decoupled, hybrid, you name it, uh, it, you can do it. Um, I think the, the biggest advantage of, of Drupal is the development community. And this is like really something that like Gartner or also other analyst firms will get in. Like how easy is it to make custom code for a specific software? Uh, the development community is huge here. Um, and also this pre-packaged component part, uh, which is the module ecosystem in Drupal. Um, yeah, that's an A+. Plus. The next thing is, it's like, okay, uh, we probably passed, but it requires custom coding and deploying in public or private clouds quickly. PHP isn't cloud's best friend. Uh, so if you look at Amazon or Google uh, or Azure, um, quickly look down upon you and saying, well, um, I, I prefer uh, Python or, or a couple of other um, you know, softwares which can be really contained and great in artifacts. Um, doing Drupal hosting, um, there are specialized companies that run Drupal in, in the cloud, like Platform SH, Anquia, DropSolid, and etc. Um, it's possible to do this yourself, but it requires a lot of effort. Um, Ease of use for site visitors, content editors, developers, analysts. Um, Drupal also gets some criticism there uh, for having you know, quite a complicated user interface. I think we can do better, but we still kind of pass. It's probably fine. But also creating alternate UIs. Uh, um, we have the layout builder now in, in Drupal. Um, it's being used to create different kind of UIs and with breakpoints and, and whatnot. Um, but it's still not really stable enough um, for uh, a content marketeer to, to really figure out uh, how to get there. Um, it doesn't mean that with these other products or these other companies I've shown, it's any better. Um, 
And then the thing that, that Drupal doesn't really do um, is like the yeah, AI, AI parts, natural language generation, neural networks, etc. I mean, we can make it work, uh, but it requires a lot of, lot of effort. Um, and then empowering users to make the right people and decisions, which basically means getting on the right. towards really building complicated workflows and sites. Um, but then if we think a step further, uh, making sure that we can personalize that search or boost results with AI, uh, adding recommended content, uh, better search, coupling with marketing automation tools, that gets a bit more tricky. Uh, and that's not out of the box. And then these, these are even harder to do and capture anonymous and authenticated traffic, change the site according to the intent, uh, introduce personalization. Um, these are all, at this point, you, you require like another software as a service tool um, to help you with this. And it's not fully integrated with Drupal. Um, we cannot ask Drupal to be fully uncacheable uh, and uh, making sure that every request comes in, that it's different. Um, so that, that requires um, another so perhaps not technology, um, and I know in the in this morning there's another session. Um, I forgot by whom uh, talks about personalization like Netflix. Um, I don't know how he's solving the problem, but he's solving basically the, the same problem like this. Uh, how, how do you embed personalization in Drupal? Okay, so what do we have uh, translated? We have a Drupal and massive ecosystem and community on Drupal.org. There is intensive integration with Solar, Elasticsearch, using Search API for the whole um, uh, search problem that we're trying to solve. There's uh, an open source Mautic tool uh, and software to do marketing automation, very similar to HubSpot. And so at least we can do email newsletters, making workflows, trying to understand what the visitor does with this tool. Um, it doesn't mean that we can change the site according to that uh, info. And then there are many vendors for hosting the Drupal site on steroids and making it easy to deploy in the cloud um, to support technology for solar and elastic. So that's it. What are we missing? We don't have this, these three uh, things. We don't have a customer data platform. Like where does the data all go? Putting it all in Google, Google Analytics is not enough because it's hard to export, it's hard to customize, it's uh, hard to own. We don't have personalization and we also don't have consent management. Consent management means that the cookie banner that you all know, that it's somewhere tracked who clicked on OK or who clicked on what do we allow, and then how do we translate that towards personalization. Um, Google Tag Manager is often used there but it doesn't mean that it stores the consent that the user gave. And it also doesn't mean that the visitor can see what is all stored and tracked for the visit. So what if we can go from, from this, uh, for what we are missing, to, to this by introducing a new uh, open core, a new open source software system um, that has the same freedom um, like Drupal that has the same freedom like Mautic that doesn't require licenses and etc. So um, this is what I'm going to show you now in a little video. Um, hopefully the video plays well over Zoom. Um, so far is it good? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <clears throat> So what we're seeing here is that um, we have this software, um, and I'll explain what it is afterwards. It's capturing anonymous and authenticated traffic. I selected just the title, which was not an, 
a link or, or anything. Um, we can see in, in Chrome that it captured that. And now um, the, the interface in, in the Drop Solid platform, uh, which is basically just a connector towards this open source software, shows you all these profiles um, and shows you that this person actually selected that text. And so this is um, very basic tracking of uh, authenticated and anonymous traffic. What we can then do is based on this data, we can create rules and um, the rules basically segments uh, can be detected in real time, and then Drupal suddenly knows, okay, uh, people that select this text, and you need to show different content to them. What you see here are all kind of properties that are uh, available out of the box. For example, if people submit two forms, it could be that they're very interested, um, and then I want them to be in the segment of highly engaged visitor, and show different content to them. Uh, okay. So that's one thing. Um, if we go even further, and if we want to change the site according to that intent, so we, we now created that segment. Uh, now we're in, in Drupal in uh, Umami, um, and the software is called Unomi. It's a little confusing with those two words, um, but there's a Drupal module where you can. Um, say, okay, this is the, the server, uh, similar to solar, um, you connect it, and what it does right now, um, maybe let's pause for a second, um, is that it shows a drop-down of those segments in paragraphs, and you're able to uh, select which paragraph you want to show to which segment. So people that fill in two forms, for example, they get different content, so a different paragraph block, um, then people that don't fill in two forms, maybe they need a bit more um, guidance. People that fill in two forms are already quite engaged. It's just one case. Um, so that's an integration that already exists. And um, if we couple it and then go even further, um, this is an example of the drop solid uh, tool that analyzes this data, which is the open data. Uh, from the Apache Unomi case, um, and there's a machine learning model that uh, tries to figure out what are the four main um, groups that exist in my site traffic. Uh, um, you can also say that there's eight. Um, this is the, yeah, the magic of machine learning. Uh, you just give it all the data, you say this is the algorithm, um, and try to figure out what are the most distinct groups. groups. In the case of Drop Solid, we found out that there's people interested in uh, applying for a job. There's people interested in um, what are your customers and what kind of solutions do you do. And then there's people interested in technical decisions. Um, but how do you convert that now to these segments? And so what happens is that we want to auto detect the intention uh, of people visiting the site without creating rules of people that um, click on uh, this link and then on that link, because that's very complex. Um, how, does that, like, how does that translate to towards the site? And this is what you, you will see on this video. Um, the site changes based on the applicant, based on people that are interested in community, based on people that are interested in business decision making, and based on people that are, are interested in technical decision making. So you no longer have personalization on, on uh, people click on link A and B uh, or submit two forms. You now have personalization based on um, mathematical uh, calculations of chance that people are in a certain bucket. Um, and it, it gets a lot easier to start personalizing and to start detecting the intent. All right, so how does that then translate into to numbers, and there's also dashboards that can then say, okay, give me all the applicants, give me all the business decision makers, um, etc. So um, you can also think of these uh, segments as personas. Remember, in the beginning, you're in control of the customer, you're in control of what this website needs to do. You basically define also uh, who is this website for. 
Um, so this is very similar. These are the personas that this website is for. I'm going to change the website for these personas. What you can then see, and this is a dashboard that we've built just for the, the drop solid site, is like how many profiles are in this segment, um, how many form submits, etc. So then you can start to do analytics, uh, but also A-B testing. Okay, so let's um, move on a bit. Like how do we do this? Um, how can you do this? Uh, there's a, a software from the Apache Foundation called You Know Me, um, pronounced as You Know Me. Right? Um, and it's used to capture data. Uh, it's a Java server um, that is linked to Elasticsearch. Uh, um, and it captures all the data. It does consent management. It uh, has the rules engine. Um, it can do real-time segment. There's no license fee. It really follows the whole open core principle, the open source principle. It's not any different than, for example, Apache Solar um, and um, I see tremendous potential here for Drupal to do really in-depth integration um, with Drupal to um, comply with those new requirements on personalization, on uh, tracking, on privacy management, um, etc. So um, to, to put the theory to practice, to the, we created this module, the You Know Me module, um, a couple weeks ago. Um, we were testing it internally already, um, but this module is, is not tied to any company at all. So you can set up this You Know Me software, you can um, set up this module and it will work. Uh, um, it doesn't have an interface at this point, um, but I'm asking for maybe some help to, to get that interface. Um, what also exists is that there is a client library, it's a You Know Me SDK. Um, it's in, PHP library, so you can also use it for, for example, Symfony um, and a bunch of others. Um, there's even a You Know Me SDK node module. Um, uh, we use it in the, the platform, what you saw to build those rules or to make those rules. It's all uh, built using Angular that then uses this um, library. So we're creating as much as possible as open source so that, that you um, can also start to create such solutions for your customers without getting into SaaS software with expensive licenses with um, you know, the, the major part of this where you will have a lock-in. Um, if you start to use Optimizely or a couple of other solutions out there, um, you're locked in. Many of the vendors have great software as a service, but they own your data. You don't know where it's stored. You have no idea what you do with it. Um, and the, the sentiment that you see in the world is that there's more and more protectiveness on that data. Why shouldn't you be able to control uh, who hosts that data? Hmm? Um, you can say with, with this you know software, I'm hosting my own Elasticsearch because I don't trust you and I want to use and control that data myself. Um, so uh, this is some suggestion that I have for you. Uh, you believe in Drupal, you believe in Apache Solar, you, you may or may not believe in Monty, but it's open core. Uh, you believe in Nginx and Docker, all these other technologies. Why would you settle for less when it comes to data? Uh, somehow we're not thinking about that too much, but uh, we say, okay, I want to host everything myself, or I want to have everything in control myself, but data, well, no, we push it to Google Analytics, we push it to um, personalization, um, SaaS software like Aquilift or like um, Optimizely. Yeah, there is also Segment.io. Um, I don't think you should accept um, that that's the only thing that exists. Um, I think we as a community should also embrace what's out there in terms of open source and open core software and follow that principle as much as, as we can. Um, I also believe it's the next phase of the business model of that software um, and that it's, it's not worth it to invest in anything else. Um, so in, in my idea or my future of, of the web, it means that this is the bigger picture. And we have multi-channel, um, we have Drupal as API first uh, with React or Angular or uh, Gatsby, could also uh, still be 
Drupal with uh, HTML rendering using connected Motic uh, for marketing automation that is also connected to this Unomi you know for your data platform, your customer data platform, it's consent management and personalization. Um, those three components are really, really powerful to fill in most of the needs of modern or uh, future web development needs. Um, but obviously that's just my opinion. Um, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions about this. I'm also hoping that you were able to hear most of what I said. Um, and thank you for this. Any questions, anyone? Ooh, no questions. Have we got any questions on um, Zoom? Can you see? No. Okay. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah, just speak loud enough and I'll yeah, be able yeah. to hear you. Okay, so um, how does it work with a uh, search engine? For example, if a Google uh, search bot uh, comes to a page with uh, personalized uh, content, so how do you recognize him and what do you give him? That's a very good question. Huh? Um, the, the Google bot will come to your website and it will see the non-opinionated version of the site. So you always have default state. Um, Google will see the default state. Um, I think this is one of the next challenges that also Google will have, is to uh, find or maybe create a standard on how to figure out what, what kind of variations all exist. And um, I'm not sure if that challenge will be easy. Um, some of the content that you will only show to certain groups uh, after detecting, okay, they are interested in business, will not show up in Google. What was your question in the back? Yeah, so uh, you, about uh, Nomi, uh, what is, if you compare Nomi with uh, any other SaaS personalization platform, what are the key gaps? Do I know the Nomi being open source and relatively new uh, project? So what are the key gaps and key challenges that you have, seen, you have seen while implementing it for a production customer, uh, for, for a uh, enterprise customer? The, um, I don't know if the question was finished then, sorry. Yeah, question's finished. Okay, yeah. So the, the key gaps right now with Apache Nomi is that it doesn't have a user interface. Um, you could say, well, that's strange. Um, but if you think of Apache Solar, Apache Solar also, also doesn't have a, an interface to, to integrate with Drupal, Drupal created that over time. Um, so I, I do think uh, this key gap can be filled in, um, but it's not the responsibility of um, the contributors of the Apache you know me team to fill in this gap. I think it's our responsibility to fill in that gap and, and to say this is our opinion on how personalization on the web needs to work. Um, these are how we create our dashboards somehow and, and then the question is, does it need to live in Drupal or is it another tool next to Drupal that integrates with that API of Apache you know? I think those are all questions that, that still need to be answered over the course of the next couple of years. Thank you. Any other questions? You got a question? No, I don't have a question. Okay. Yeah. Do you have any answer? That doesn't really matter. Okay, hello everybody. I just want to let you know that we're going to switch around the closing keynote um, and the lunch. So the lunch is set for 12.50 and the closing keynote is set for 2 o'clock. Um, so, so Drupal Camp London team will be doing the closing um, keynote and we'll keep it nice and short. So what we'd like to do is um, if you guys can come back here at 12.50 um, we'll keep the keynote, closing keynote nice and short and after that you can go for lunch and then you, everyone can go home a little bit early. How's that sound? All good? <laughs> Great. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Nick. You're very welcome. Have, uh, have fun and stay safe. Cheers. Thank you. Yeah, bye bye.